Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Christian Concerns Round the Table. This is an opportunity each Friday to look at some of the stories uh, that are going on in the news uh, that relate to our work and uh, to talk about them uh, with some members of our team and sometimes with other people. Uh, today, we've got some really interesting guests. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today uh, by three people uh, who have been responding this week to a really interesting campaigning letter sent by some church leaders on the topic of conversion therapy. Uh, first by Dr. Karis Mosley. She's a researcher on our public policy team. Uh, she studied classics at the University of Cambridge and theology at, at the Universities of Oxford and Edinburgh. She held a research post in academic theology at Edinburgh and also taught Christian theology and ethics. So she's uh, well placed to speak on these issues. Hi, Karis. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> also by uh, Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, who is an author and writer at, let me let me try and say the name properly, Sofizo.com. Sofizo, Sofizo. Okay, thank you. Uh, and is also a uh, theologian and a member of General Synod, managing editor at uh, Grove Books, and a junk professor at Fuller, Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, who has been responding to this as well. And also by uh, Reverend Matthew Roberts, uh, who is ministry at, minister at Trinity Church York. He's part of the in, uh, International Presbyterian Church. And both uh, Ian and Matthew are authors and signatories uh, on the uh, minister's, consultation, minister's consultation response relating to this, uh, which was signed by over 2,500 church leaders. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's really great to have you all with us. Very good to be here. Yeah, so... Uh, so let me let me talk about what's been happening. Last last week, we were responding to this breaking news uh, about the government's double U-turn on conversion therapy. Um, a leak seemed to show that the government was planning not to pursue a ban on conversion therapy, but to at least uh, not to pursue further legislation about it, but to use existing laws to try and crack down on it. Uh, then after some well-organized pressure uh, from MPs and campaigners, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson appears to have changed his mind and decided to pursue a new law after all, but only targeting conversion therapy that relates to sexuality and not to gender. So that was last week, uh, and you can look back at our discussion then uh, to hear, hear more on that. Uh, but the discussion has now moved on largely to this issue of gender. And one striking intervention this week was a letter that was written by uh, Steve Chalk and signed by a few church leaders, including... Uh, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. So I, I'd like to read it to you now, and then I'm going to ask Matthew and the rest of the panel uh, to explain some of their responses uh, to what this letter says. I think we're going to bring it up on the screen. Um, here we go. So, dear Prime Minister, on the ban of conversion therapy excluding trans people, Conversion to Christianity is the event or process by which a person responds joyfully to the glorious embrace of the eternally loving and ever merciful God. It has nothing to do with so-called conversion therapy, pressure put by one person on another to fit their expectations, the attempt to induce vulnerable and isolated people to deny who they truly are. To be trans is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole, precious, honoured and loved by yourself by others and by God. It continues to, to, uh, to go on uh, on the letter and uh, calling on the conversion <coughs> and to include uh, gender. So Matthew, uh, you first you were first out of the gates with this with a comment um, in the critic. Do you want to explain a little bit of what you were saying there? Yes, by, by all means. Uh, I think this is a, a very, very revealing letter. Um, and principally because of the sentence in the in the middle of it there which uh, says to be trans is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole um what does the word sacred mean uh, well it's the same as the word holy actually um holy is the germanic form of the latin word uh, that sacred comes from but they both translate the same words in the bible uh, and of course holiness and particularly the holiness of god is a major biblical theme um, in fact, holiness is always, in one sense, God's holiness, because what holiness means is uh, God's absolute purity, his um, hugely um, fierce righteousness. His holiness is a consuming fire. His holiness means that Moses has to take off his shoes when he approaches the, 
the burning bush, told not to come any near it. Um, uh, God's holiness is, uh, is uh, about the, the fire that consumes on top of Mount Sinai. Um, it's about how God is completely untouched by any evil and, uh, and that he is in, in one sense totally different to us um, and, uh, and everything about us which a lot of which is, is wrong filed by sin, is, uh, is completely separate from him. So loads and loads in the Bible about how God's holiness is a huge thing. But of course, the gospel, the, the incredible good news of the gospel is that uh, the holy God has uh, come to us in the person of his holy son, uh, the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the holy one, of course. Um, and what, what Jesus has done is to offer himself as a sacrifice uh, in order to call us to the holy god is to, is to to sanctify us uh that's the, from the same word as sacred to make us holy people in other words to call us away from what we are naturally and in ourselves uh, and to the to, to be more like god so peter puts it really uh, wonderfully clearly in his letter um, as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Um, now, I say all of that because that's the background to um, to what, what's being said in this letter is in being trans uh, is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole. That turns the entire concept of holiness on its head. Or well, actually, it'd be better to put it this way. It's saying that what is holy is not God so that we're to be conformed to be like him. The really holy thing is what I am like on the inside. And so I've got to change myself and my body and everything else to become like him. Now, in that, that's, that, that is, that's a pagan notion of holiness. Uh, it's about kind of trying to change creation, change reality to conform to the passions and desires of my heart. The very thing that, of course, God in Christ calls us away from. And so what, what this is really exposed is that. Um, what's going on in the trans agenda is a uh, it, it's a religion it's a religious uh, quest it's a it's a religious desire to uh, to to transcend our bodies by kind of not going out of ourselves to God but into ourselves to some mysterious um, identity that I find inside myself <coughs> that's profoundly dangerous and worrying because I mean, that, that's what led the Canaanites to mutilate their bodies to try to influence the gods to meet their expectations and to do their role the crops grow and the, the cattle breed and stuff um and uh, it, it's the glory of christianity that it is god who is holy and calls us to himself uh, to call what is blatantly uh, an act of self-damage in taking hormones or in uh, drastically either removing or uh, or, or distorting or whatever it is surgically changing the body and to call that a sacred quest is it, that's not just different to Christianity that's it opposite um, and it's something that's very dangerous and needs to be called out as such it's a religion that calls people to damage themselves in the name of a religious quest and we can't support that hmm. yeah I Matthew I think that's very helpful and, and, and I really appreciate your article the critic and in my article I actually quoted you a couple of times um, I I think what's really interesting is looking at looking at that letter again I uh, I'm, I'm very struck by the fact there was a couple of things there I would absolutely heartily agree with. So one of the things the letter does is says that conversion to Christianity uh, is very different from conversion therapy. And conversion therapy is about the coercive. I think the word they use is, is, uh, is, is it to manipul manipulate someone to be, become what you want them to be. And in those two things, I would absolutely agree with them. And, and previously, um, Matthew and I had been co-authors of a letter uh, responding to the government's consultation on conversion therapy and what we said to them is that you're not you haven't defined the word conversion therapy at all what you're doing is you actually because you've used the word conversion which is a christian religious term you're muddling the two things up and we say absolutely up front we completely reject any sense of coercion any sense of manipulation. And if, if that ever happens then that is wrong and is to be repented of that is not what christian ministry is about but at the same time the letter makes i think two very serious errors the first is that it talks about conversion as em embracing the all loving all merciful god um as if as if christian conversion is simply about being affirmed in all i am by by god's love when of course the word conversion itself i often ask people do you know where the word conversion comes from in the bible because it's not in most english translations 
It actually comes from Jesus saying to his disciples, unless you change and become like little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And then the authorized version is unless ye be converted. So the, the, the principal understanding of conversion, of, of coming to faith is recognizing the love of God and recognizing the love of God uh, and, and the love of God, which is beyond measure because it, it led him to give himself up for us. But it did that in order, not that he, God might affirm what we are, but God might actually form us to be what he longs for us to be. Now, again, we need to be really careful about how we understand that. As far as I'm concerned, um, God isn't asking us to become straight instead of gay or to, in, in that sense, to uh, um, become white instead of black or anything like that. He is calling us to a holiness of life. But it, but it, is, a, it is something that becomes change, that, become, that, that, that involves change. And when the letter says that it's about becoming what we truly are, as Matthew said, the, the question is, how do we discover what we truly are? Do, is it by looking inwards at our pattern of desires and frustrations and dissatisfaction? And in particular, is it about dissatisfaction with our, our bodily selves? Now, I think it's really key that we locate this discussion within the, the, the massive pastoral challenges around the whole question of gender dysphoria uh, amongst particularly growing, it seems to me, unhappiness amongst y many young people with their, their sex bodies or how they appeal. We need to recognize the pressures, particularly on young people, because we live in an Internet age. We live in an, an Instagram age and a TikTok age, and a Snapchat age where where these technologies can put enormous social pressure on people to conform, to look in a particular way. And in fact, it's these things which are coercive and these things which put, put pressure on people. And one of the things that happened to me was very interesting. I would commented online on these uh, on the letter. And uh, someone who's, I think, a, a friend of a friend uh, got in touch with me and said, well, I'm a parent of a, of, a, of a trans child and this is the situation I'm in. And that's why I wrote what I did. And I said, look, the first, the first thing we must recognize about the claim that Steve Chalk and others are making, he's actually, he's actually making claims at three levels. The first one is at the pastoral level. And the first claim they seem to be making to me is to say, if I come, this is the language that this, somebody's used to me, if I hate my sexed body, then the, the appropriate pastoral response is to medically or surgically intervene to change my body. Now, that's the first claim that's being made. And I think that's a claim that a lot of people want to challenge. And it's a lot of people, not religious people, not for religious uh, reasons, but it's a lot of secular campaigners. It's a group, groups of parents of transgender children who are who do not agree with trans ideology. And they are saying, we don't agree that this is the best or the most appropriate pastoral response. The real challenge for parents of children like this is they're caught between a rock and a hard place. So, you know, if if you're a parent of a child who has got to this stage of hating their own body, what do you do? Because you, you, you want to support and love your child on the one hand, and yet you're also aware that this child is under enormous social and cultural and ideological pressure to say the way out of this situation is to have surgical and medical intervention. And, and I think that's a, that's a desperately difficult situation to be in as a parent. I think it's a really difficult situation to be in as the, as the person, young person yourself. And that's, that's the basic building block of assumption this letter makes. It then goes on to say, our true selves are found by looking in rather than looking out or looking at our actual bodies. And therefore, it's assuming a kind of distance between me and my body as if we are two separate things and our body is just sort of a, 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 an artifact or an entity or something I possess rather than being who I am. And then thirdly, it's making this radical religious claim that on top of these other two claims, this itself is a religious quest. So I think there's multiple problems with this letter. But I don't I don't want to let hold of the really painful pastoral realities for young people and for their parents as well. Thanks, Ian. That's that's helpful. Karis, I'd really like you to respond in part to this issue of identity uh, that Ian's raised that comes that comes out of the letter and becoming uh, becoming who you are and yeah. um, this idea of sex body and a sex soul being different. I, I know you've written on that before. So yeah, tell us I about think, it. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, it's true that for, well, for people of any age, not just young people, it's it's painted as an issue of identity. Um, but I think I'd want to ask, give, ask, you know, the letter writers themselves, what is sacred about certain things 
that are actually going on because they have this very high language of sacred and whole and holistic. But what is sacred about um, effectively treating puberty, for example, as a disease um, and giving children puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones? What is sacred and holistic about essentially mutilating the sec sex sexual characteristics of the child to conform to um, perhaps a mentality that's perhaps in process. It's not just a fixed um, identification of the opposite sex when you look carefully and when you actually listen and talk with people. Uh, what is sacred about women growing beards or men feminizing their faces? Um, what is sacred about, well, it's essentially deceiving others, no doubt sometimes out of pain, but also sometimes in relation to fetish. And there are all these practical examples. And so, Ian, you were mentioning the you know, non-religious campaign. Is that's the sort of thing that they would be asking. Mm. And it is effective. Well, the problem is that it's making them think about what is the, they wouldn't put it this way, but the what's the religious identity that Steve Chalker and Williams and so on actually represent? What is, we wouldn't mm. talk about Christian identity, but the, the what is what's what is the Christian view of identity and uh, human identity and vocation? And that is actually driving people further away from the Christian church. And you can mm. see that openly on social media. So that's what I want to say about that. And the other thing I think behind these, the actual realities of cutting up the body, treating it in a proprietary manner, is that that mentality is actually behind the gender clinics themselves. So um, John Randall, the, the man who founded uh, the first gender clinic of Britain, the Charing Cross Hospital Gender Clinic, he wrote academic papers, um, which you can find in archives. And he, in one of them, he actually talks about the, the in the Greco-Roman period during the Roman Empire, you had the Syrian mother goddess, Cybele, and you had men who would ritually castrate themselves. And they'd go around in Rome and other big cities at the time of specific religious, pagan religious festivals, and they would offer up their severed genitals. And he's, and John, what John Randall seems to do is to say, well, this is kind of um, a tendency some people have. And isn't, surely there should be a niche in modern society, an outlet for them. And then, of course, these men would cross dress as, as pagan priests. And, and really, he's implying that gender clinics should facilitate this. And it's this anti-Christian and anti-Jewish um, religion that is at the core of gender clinics. And I think, you know, I feel like I need, you know, we need to do a better job of communicating that to the public. Because I'm not sure whether the likes of Steve Chalk and Williams and the other signatories understand that. Right. Or if they do, whether they would want to admit it. Yeah. Can I, can I push back on a couple of things there, Karis? I think that's extraordinary to, to, to realise that. And that's why I, I also felt that, Matthew, you put it extremely well when you talked about this as an alternative religion. I think there's, there's, there's two, two dilemmas that, that presents me with. One is that the, the, the danger is that it looks as like we're just campaigning for ourselves. And it's, this is self-interested Christians protecting Christian belief. Yeah. And it seems to me we've, we've also got to broaden this out and say, hang on a second. If, if, if some things are actually true about how humans are constituted, then actually it's not it's not simply about defending our own position. It's actually saying, hang on a second, we think harm is being done here. And in fact, as you say, there have been some really negative reactions to this letter from non-religious people who are saying, well, hang on a second, people are now using their religion to abuse young people by cutting off their bits of their body. And you know that you can almost you can actually picture that in 10 years' time, people are going to look back and this is going to be the next, you know, child abuse scandal on behalf of the church. If if people are using religious language to justify this kind of thing. I think the second thing that 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 I'm I'm still feeling very acutely, partly because of, for instance, there's a, um, one transgender, a trans woman who has commented on my blog quite a lot and, and, and tackles me quite often on social media. And she said, hey, look, last night my daughter was attacked by um, transphobic men who abused her. And you're contributing to this. I said, well, hang on a second. Is it, is it possible to care for people in this situation on the one hand but actually say we don't agree with the ideological and the philosophical and the religious assumptions behind it on the other. And how do we do that? And how do we disaggregate those things? Because, you know, I think like uh, Matthew will find this too, like most church leaders I found, you know, in every church that I've been in, there's, there's been either someone or a, a family member who has someone in their family who's experienced this. So this, this is, this is, you know, a far reaching pastoral issue. And how do we, show care on the one hand but so but also give clarity on the other now, i think that's a that's a re really interesting question and i think uh, in a way that this letter from 
you talk and the others has has sort of opened up a a way to do that i think in that what it's demonstrated is that um that there, there is a real thing here going on of a sort of religious hatred of the body um you know your your body there's lots of lots of examples of this in the trans literature um the bbc produced a video for teenagers saying that your your body is a walking meat skeleton and that's all it is um and uh and that the, your body is something which is basically an obstacle to uh, to being truly you. And of course, that's in this letter, isn't it? So they say in, inducing people to deny who you truly are. And of course, your mm-hmm. body is an obstacle in the in the way of who you truly are. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> one of the glorious things that we can say, and we must say, is that is that Christianity has a uniquely good view of the body. What what uh, because God really is the creator of the world. The Christian God is the, he is the creator of the world, and he and he made our Bodies and he made them good, and and everything about our bodies is there to uh, is there to point us to good things about uh, not not only about ourselves but about God, about the gospel. God made us male and female to to point us towards um, His purposes in saving us in Christ, and uh, lots of things about that. So it means we can say to say to all young people, particularly young people, this matters for, isn't it? Is that you're being told by the world that your body is basically certainly irrelevant. Its structure and its functions are an irrelevance. Um, but they may even be a problem, um, and uh, and you've got to be ready to basically yeah butcher it or stop it or block it or uh, and that's how you find enlightenment is by sort of mm. wriggling out of the constraints of your body. And what, what what we can say is no, your body is good, and I think that that's really really helpful in the in the, the pastoral care of people who have basically been told that your body is a problem and your body is. Bad and your body needs to be ignored, etc. It's to say, no, you God made you good, and and the, the way that you are designed is good. And it, uh, one thing that that the whole LGBT movement does is to is to kind of it talks all the time about becoming whole, but it does the opposite. Is that what it does is it sets people fundamentally against the function and the design of your body, and it does that clearly for transgender but that's actually only a development of something that's already there in all the lgb uh, bit as well which basically says the design and the function of your body has no purpose it has no meaning uh, the only real function of it there is to is for mm-hmm. is for sexual pleasure for you or for others and it, yeah. and if it doesn't if that doesn't get you it doesn't grab you yeah. then then bin it you know and um and we've got a fabulously better thing to say god made you good he loves mm. your body he wants to put you at peace with your body uh, and it feels yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's really helpful. And it feels to me as though, you know, as a church, we've sometimes got some work to do on this and recognizing this as part of our, our heritage. I was actually really helped last year reading uh, Andrew Wilson's book, God of All Things. He just starts off by saying, do you know what? There's a real mystery here. God is immaterial, but God has expressed who God is through creating a material world. And in particular, mm-hmm. God, God does not have a body, but humanity made in his image is bodily. And even more than that, God is not sexed. But humanity, male and female, has made his image. So there, there is a there is a, a massive sort of theological issue here that we we, we probably need to wrestle more. And since reading that, I've been thinking about that more and more. But I think you're right. And the other thing that I I valued about your comment, Matthew, was that th- this is not. I mean, for Christians, again, a lot of people have said to me, "Hey, look, just let live and let live. You know, we're here to care for people. Just just accept people as they are and whatever they say." But but I think you've rightly highlighted the fact that the question of who we are as bodily humanity touches on some really critical central things central issues um it, it is about what what was god doing in creation it, it, it is about it is about you know for those of a more catholic orientation it's about the incarnation jesus came to us bodily and that's not insignificant if bodies didn't matter mm-hmm. why did jesus need to be become bodily and of course because we became bodily because humanity is either male or female he had to become either male or female um, I'm not going to dive into the debate about what, what the significance of the one rather than the other. But but it, again, resurrection, you know, and, and I see for, for me, I, I touch this and people go, oh, really? I say the Christian hope of the future is not that we leave our bodies and we live our spirits are set free and live a disembodied life with God in heaven. It's that we we sleep in death and await bodily resurrection. My wife knows very well that I, I if I die, I'm sure I will predecease her. I am to be buried because Christian burial is a symbolic pointer to the hope that we sleep in death and await bodily resurrection. And I say that to a lot of Christians and they go, really? Really? I thought we I thought we said, oh, the body, this person isn't here now. They've, they've gone up to be with God in heaven. And it just, it realizes, it makes me realize that 
on so this central question of who has God made us? What does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. Actually, we have made some serious missteps as a church. And I think as a that's why, as a result of that, we are often not prepared, not equipped. We've been slow to respond to these kinds of, of movements. And, and we, we treat them in a pragmatic pastoral way rather than recognizing the theological issues which need to shape our pastoral care. I mean, goodness me, when Paul is talking about sexual ethics to the Christians in Corinth, he actually, where does he go? He goes to the hope of bodily resurrection, saying, look, your bodies matter because your bodies matter because your destiny in Christ is to be like he was raised bodily. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, I don't know, Matthew, if I can pull a fast one over you here. We, we, good, we good Anglicans, we actually do recognize this in our liturgy. I mean, when I'm leading communion, I find myself going back now more and more to the words of administration in the Book of Common Prayer, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, eat this in remembrance of the Christ. Uh, may, the may the body of Christ, given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Eat this and remember the Christ died for you and feed on me in heart by faith of thanksgiving. So it is, we do explicitly in the Anglican liturgy say, you are body and soul, your body, your body, soul unity. And it's your body, soul unity that God is preserving to eternal life. Absolutely. I totally um, agree with that. And even us Presbyterians do say similar things as well. And I think the resurrection of the body is hugely important here, but it's important theologically and it's important um, apologetically. It's important pastorally. It's important uh, uh, apologetically because we, when people kind of say, well, you know, how can you say that it's wrong to damage your body? We want to say, well, we're going to be raised to new life with all the wounds of our body healed, and uh, and so the last thing we want to do is damage them because God is going to is, is going to remake them. It's also partially wonderfully important. We're going to have more and more people coming to our churches who have who are who are victims of having been sold the lie mm. that they could find enlightenment by damaging their bodies. And of course, they're not at all excluded from the glories of Christ by that, but their bodies won't be healed in this life if they've mm. taken some of these more drastic treatments. But mm. but they will be healed uh, and they will be raised. And that is a wonderful promise um, mm. uh, that that is held out that, that we even the most drastic forms of self-harm um, are redeemed by Christ dying and rising for us. Praise mm. God for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, we've got in our chat, uh, amongst other people, uh, Pete Benjamin. He uh, is a, he's detransitioned from uh, gender issue. He, um, you can see his video on our YouTube channel. Thanks for coming again, Pete. Um, Karis, any comments on what you've just been hearing? There's quite a lot of quite a lot of theology there. Um, so, <laughs> I think um, I agree. Well, theology is good, isn't it, Paul? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, Karis. Have everything up to the resurrection and and the new new creation as well is is the hope of that um i think that shows you that god's everything about god god's love god's authority is um not of this world because this world is radically turned against god and where what what interests me i mean you could you know this is such a large topic and it's just a very short letter but it opens up so much mm. is what the angle i've um, been focusing on more is the sort of ethical angle in relation to the state because the letter ultimately is about getting um, a ban a full conversion debit ban from the state now that when you do a bit of digging um and i, I did i have concentrated on Robert williams you could do other digging on each one of the the signatories of course and, and chart how they've their reasoning has developed but um i think that it's important to they talk about safe spacing the church basically every church should be a safe space that affirms people and be who they are without fear of judgment um, which in the context of the letter is very much about not questioning this idea that trans is the start of a sacred journey. Okay, it's beyond question. This is an absolute truth. And it's because it's the absolute truth that the state seems some people in government want to affirm and others are not so sure. So we're in the middle of a big um, controversy here. But when we look specifically at the former Archbishop of Canterbury, he has... Um, said some some things before on this debate that um, which are highly relevant so last year it's actually a month ago now um he took part in a in a it was a session for mps on banning conversion therapy and it was organized by um alicia kearns who's a leading uh, mp campaigning for this and um so i thought well he's never actually written about this so what could he have to say and towards the end what he said um 
he he suggested what we could do to have a sort of a ban in churches um, in relation to informal counselling and prayer and pulpit preaching. And he spoke about spiritual abuse, which, of course, is there's a well-known campaign about that by um, Jane Ozan. Um, and then he said, is the Church of England, but I think he means any church, properly capable of monitoring its own practice without external input? So he was thinking about, uh, we were talking about child abuse earlier, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse and its investigation of religious bodies, which has just concluded. And, uh, and this is what he said, okay, which is relevant, because we're talking about knowledge and ways of knowing. We should be able to say to religious professionals, in other words, clergy, it is not within your scope to deny certain kinds of information and access. So what does that really mean? Well, if you go and look at the whole video, it's very evident. Um, if somebody around with issues around sexuality or gender identity and confusion come to a member of the clergy or a pastor, um, and perhaps they're confused, they don't know what to think, they're asking what, uh, what to do and how to live. The pastor should have to refer them to trans or LGBT friendly organisations and their resources. OK, and, and it's interesting because Rob Williams was implicitly accusing churches um, and especially Church of England of not of of denying people information. Now, that's extraordinary because you've just spoken earlier in this in discussion that we are having about social media and the Internet age and how we're actually bombarded by information, whether it's true or not, it masquerades as information mm -hmm. on these kinds of issues. And so he is treating or wanting to treat churches as closed cults. And I think this is really important for viewers to understand. I'll have something by the end of the day, hopefully, up explaining this in writing. But by treating churches as closed close-minded if they teach according to scripture as close-minded and in need of giving parishioners or members information that the state approves of but which the church mm. really doesn't mm. um that's that opens a kind of worms about church state relations what it means to mm. be a christian church mm. how do we understand what other people or the state counts as information knowledge truth mm. reality um Mm. And it's it's uh, I think that's highly concerning. So we're talking about, you know, there's a the big theological horizon of the resurrection, the, the new creation in Christ and stuff. But this is the actual horizon in history today in the next few months. Mm. A government that doesn't believe in all of that, actually. Nobody says Britain is a Christian country anymore. Um, this is the reigning ideology, although there mm. are some lots of little interpretations of it. So that is what I want to say that we look out at. Um, yeah. Treating churches as cults is what is really behind conversion therapy bans. I don't have more time to explain that now. Anyway. But I think, Karis, that picks up two other issues. I mean, again, this is just one example of, of, of where we're at in terms of culture. Uh, in a sense, I suppose what you're talking about is one version of what you might we might call an illiberal liberalism, which is that, you know, we can have so-called liberal or radical ideas, but but heaven forbid that you should actually challenge me or question me about this. And the lack of transparency. I mean, it's really been, been fascinating to see over the last few months how many businesses now are ditching Stonewall, for example, as a as an inclusion monitor, because what they've realized is that Stonewall says you must be inclusive. Stonewall says we'll mark you as inclusive. But provided you do all the things to put in place, by the way, the things you need to put in place is buy courses from us. So Stonewall is marking their own homework and, and the lack of transparency there. And I think the lack of transparency, again, people have raised questions about, you know, how is Stonewall infiltrate parts of government and, and, and influence that? And we do. We want transparency, we want openness. And, and I think it's, it's again for us to say as Christians, we believe in openness and we believe in debate. We, we, we think that we should have an open debate about this. Again, what I find, I'm find i finding on social media the last couple of days since publishing my blog article is people just closing the debate down. So I, I just posted an article from Unheard uh, yeah. yesterday uh, yesterday morning. So he says, oh, so why are you, trans why are you posting uh, that trans written by a well-known transphobe? Is it because <laughs> you're always right and nobody can ever contradict you? I said, no, I, I put it up because I think it's true. And, and the whole point about this is we have a debate about it, but you don't seem to want to debate about it. It, it, it needs to be closed down. I think the other dynamic, and uh, this is a much, much, much bigger question is, look at us, here we are, four of us having a conversation, none of us in each other's bodily presence. And we... we We've got, a, we've got a big issue here, which is that the internet is a way in which people relate in a disembodied way. And therefore, yeah. therefore, the generation that has grown up in the internet in the, in the social media age, no wonder they can imagine humanity or themselves in a disembodied sense, because a lot of relationships are 
completely disembodied. I, I get I get friend requests from people around the world, and I think, is this a real person? What do they really look like? Because you can put any old photo up, and and so I usually block block them or, yeah. or, or don't. I think um, that's true. I mean, I'm glad that we've all grown up before that, and and you can sort of, oh, when yeah. you see people, and you can imagine a little bit of what it's like for them. But but it's true that under people are born after a certain year no longer have such a memory and when you talk to them about all kinds of social trends they actually assume things according to what an internet age is like and it obviously it does has affected you're absolutely right and it's affected trust some people are too trusting mm -hmm. and some people are completely untrusting and that also goes back to how you see the state and the church as well mm -hmm. and i think then that there is a um that there's a sort of double duty that this puts on us as as Christians. What one is, um, we do need to just to realise what a good thing the gospel is, and what, uh, a lot of what we need to do as Christians is to kind of relearn just how good the gospel is. I think we've been quite afraid for a while that maybe there's a bad side to the gospel that we've got to kind of we've got to we've got to exactly. you know, we've got to do this whole Christian morality thing. Normally, likes it is not very nice, so but we've got to stick with it. No, that's not true at all. Christian morality is wonderfully good news, and we need to be. And one of the aspects of that is. We believe in bodily union where I'm preaching on Sunday on uh, on how why Jesus gave us one loaf and one cup at the Lord's Supper. And, you know, even the fact you know, that, you know, but why I catch germs from it? Well, you know, it's because we're supposed to be together and what and there is a real unity, a physical unity that comes with being a member of Christ's church, which called means assembly and is a body, which is a wonderful thing that you just don't get elsewhere anymore. And so we need to really present all of that. And, the, and that goes with the goodness of the human body. The other the flip side of it is I think we've got to be much more willing to be prophetic in uh, in calling out how harmful lots of these things are and that's one of the big ironies on this conversion therapy thing is that we're being we're being accused as part of the campaign um, of of causing all sorts of harm to people um, when actually and this uh, I think it's qu quite a good thing in a way in God's providence that this letter has been written what this demonstrates is that the harm is being done uh, in spades by those who are actually pushing this thing uh, what could be more harmful than uh, than promising children spiritual enlightenment via the mutilation of their bodies. That, that is an appallingly harmful doctrine to teach children. And, and the harm of it is not kind of, oh, you know, let's find some evidence, see whether it's harmful. It is absolutely front and center. And you see it in the ruined physical body of these poor children often who've been taken in by it. Um, and uh, we're, we're not opposed to them. We're here. We, we, we want to be, be showing huge compassion uh, mm -hmm. the, to those for who have been harmed by a dreadful, a dreadful falsehood. And we need to be really bold in saying that, like most Christians around the world, we may well suffer for saying it. Um, mm -hmm. But the right thing to do, of course, is to speak the truth. Well, I'm so thankful for for you all that you are willing to do that and to speak of Christ's love and and Christ's pattern for our lives, not just in a narrow gospel sense, but in the way that it affects all, all areas of our life. And I think that's really important. One of the things um, we were doing, I mean, this le this live stream started uh, two years ago, roughly uh, at the beginning of lockdown, as was an opportunity while people were not going anywhere <laughs> to go and uh, to talk to each other and. and debate a little bit um and during that time of course we had uh closure of churches um due to due to trying to trying to obviously responsibly uh pre prevent the spread of the virus and and you've got exactly those same issues of physicality and um what is virtual church um which which come from many of the same places um ian mentioned uh websites in this disembodied kind of way of being and um and you know certain websites are quite well known for being ones where, for example, uh, female teenagers um, go on there and get, get drawn into some of these things. Tumblr is a particularly well known example of that. Um, mm. And if you permit me, one more thing: the um, there's a there's a virtual reality game called Beat Saber, uh, which which is just it's sort of dancing and you swipe things in time time with the music. It's it's a fun game in general. But one thing that people notice is that lots of the people who have the highest score on this game all, uh, are, are non-binary or trans or, or kind of portray themselves in, in the opposite gender in some way. And so there's a, there's a joke uh, that playing the game makes you uh, trans or makes you non-binary. Mm -hmm. 
Um, whereas in reality, probably this kind of game where you're more uh, detached from your body and you're in a virtual environment could well be more attractive to people who feel uh, feel that their issues are, you know, feel disconnected to their body. Um, so, so these are real issues that we need to think about when we're when we're trying to um, express our Christianity and show how it um, affects all of life. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me give you one last chance to talk because we need to we need to finish. Although I could uh, listen to you all day. Um, any final final comments from any of you? We've got to hold together compassion and truth, and uh, we've we've got to recognise the really painful situation that people are in when they're confused about, and or even get to the point of hating their sex bodies. And we've we've got we've got to get in and and to to show compassion and to help people find a better way. It seems to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, more? Into that. And the um, uh, uh, and I I think re- recognizing that the, the phrase "who you truly are." which is, gets used so much in this debate. Um, uh, and you know, all, we've been accused all the time of, of denying exactly as they do in this letter, uh, telling people to deny who they truly are. And we, we need to recognize that this idea that who you truly are is a sort of mysterious inner thing that has nothing to do with your body. Um, it's just completely backwards. Uh, human identity is to be the image of God. Wanna know who you truly are, then you need to rejoice in who god's made you but most of all you need to learn to start to rejoice in god himself which we only do when we come to jesus christ in repentance and faith and mm. that's the that's the key thing we need to be pushing on this yeah i would say that um viewers need to consider how you know if christians are silent and don't get involved in the pastoral issues the policy issues and so on then we are not trustworthy when it comes to the human body and how to live and that is how um, non-religious people will see churches. They're already saying, well, what about, you know, so-and-so saying things like I said in this letter. And so our integrity or lack of is actually on display, I think, in, in the day-to-day arena. Yeah, one one unheard article I saw today that was published yesterday um, talks about how the how the gender issues changed recently. And, um, and it lists all the kinds of people who've been speaking up truthfully about this issue mm-hmm. and... Um, mm-hmm. And Christians are not on the list. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it's not being unfair, <laughs> but maybe, but maybe there's something, some truth to that as well. well um, we, may, we may be looked at as suspect partners. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really lovely to have you, Matthew and Ian and Karis, with us today. I've just got one thing to advertise as we finish. Um, we've got a, a book launch uh, stream happening on Monday at eight pm for this book. Ruler of Kings by Joe Boot. Uh, there we've got a graphic there. So um, anyone interested in that um, can come along at on Monday. We'd be really glad to have you with us. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, actually, will we see you next week? Because next week is Good Friday. We probably won't have a stream next next week on Good Friday. Uh, I think we've all got other things to do. Uh, but I think we have. On a, on, a, <laughs> on a near Friday then, I'm sure we'll be back. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. 